All right, this video is about government involvement and competition. This is the end of chapter seven, um, the end of talking about market structures. So, so far we talked about different types of market structures, the perfect competition, monopolistic, oligopoly, and monopoly. But the government gets involved, particularly towards the end of the spectrum by uh, like oligopoly and monopoly to try and uh, achieve a few goals. Um, so the first thing is, is that um, they do have regulations. Um, we've We've talked about regulations before when we talked about supply, uh, regulations that are basically laws controlling um, business behavior. Um, so they will um, put regulations out there um, to try and uh, make sure businesses are, are doing things um, to ensure fair competition, to ensure uh, consumers are protected, um, and ensure that there's a, a good number of um, competitors out there. So one of the um, regulations that, um, one of the oldest regulations that the uh, government has out there um, is antitrust legislation. And this basically defines what a monopoly is. Um, and it sh started way back with the uh, Sherman Antitrust Act. And the Sherman Antitrust Act basically defined um, what a monopoly is and it said, okay, these are, it's a company that's, um, you know, one company that's controlling the entire industry and has a large percentage of the industry. Um, and it basically said that you know these are illegal, but it didn't do anything to actually break them up. So um, they've had, the government has passed a series of other uh, legislations since then um, to try and give the government actual power to break up uh, to break up monopolies. Uh, and to break, break up what they call trusts. So trusts, um, basically a trust is a group of companies that combine in with the intention of reducing competition. Um, they are very wary of um, the uh, intentions of companies when they merge together or acquire new companies. Um, for example, if you remember way back to US history and um, Standard Oil or JD Rockefeller um, and these companies that, you know, for example, um, would buy up their competitors or their suppliers and trying to basically go and reduce the number of companies out there, for example, the railroad companies um, that were out there trying to reduce the amount of competition. That was a trust, okay? And the part of the reason why the government got involved was because of these companies. They said, there's too large. There's no way anybody can come in and compete. Um, they also regulate mergers, and mergers are um, where there's two or more companies that combine into forming one company. Um, recently, I mean, uh, in the past, you could talk about, for example, this picture is looking at Standard Oil, um, and it was kind of uh, envisioned as this big, huge octopus that's, you know, got its tentacles in all these different aspects of the oil industry, um, and they're buying up all their competitors. Um, but today, you know, we don't have that as much because because every time um, a merger wants to go through, they have to go through the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC. The Federal Trade Commission will go and take a look at um, any companies that want to merge, and particularly companies that are in the same industry or um, will combine and form kind of a juggernaut. Um, a more recent example um, would be uh, satellite radio. It used to be uh, there was two satellite radio companies, Sirius Satellite Radio and XM Satellite Radio. Um, and originally, um, they were uh, when when they were separate companies, they were both losing money. They were bleeding money uh, because they it, it takes a lot of money to initially get the satellite up in the air um, and up into space. Uh, and so they were constantly having to work off from that debt, basically, and, and trying to be able to afford that. So in uh, when they're competing against each other they couldn't afford it but what they decided to do was they're going to merge together uh, into one satellite radio company Sirius XM satellite radio which they did um, because the Federal Trade Commission allowed them to do that they made the argument that um, there was other competitors out there um, they said you know hey what about internet radio um, that was a really new thing at the time but <laughs> the FTC bought it so they gave them the permission to actually um, combine and merge into one company. So mergers don't have to be a bad thing, but the FTC really pays attention to that because they don't want them to form with the intention of being a trust. Now, um, the government also will go and do some things to ensure fair competition. Um, so what they will do is, is they will try and outlaw some specific things, uh, make things um, these particular things illegal. 
Um, so one of these things would be price fixing. Um, price fixing happens uh, generally in oligopolies. Um, what would happen uh, if it wasn't illegal would be, uh, for example, you'd have two companies or three companies uh, in an oligopoly that sell similar products and they would get together and they would overtly set the price uh, uh, artificially high. Okay, so the businesses get together and they um, would set the price artificially high. So, for example, um, Pop. Pop is an example of an oligopoly. So, if Pepsi and Coke got together and they said, okay, we're going to set the price since we're the only, you know, real pop companies out there, real soda companies out there, we're going to set the price together. And so maybe, um, you know, we'll set it for, you know, $10 a case. Now they can't go too high. They couldn't, like for example, say hundred dollars because they know you know people just uh, stop buying it. We have a very elastic demand for um, pop, uh, but uh, they could set it you know slightly high and do some price fixing because there's so few of them. Um, I have a little cartoon here. It has these three uh, you know people that are asking for change, begging for change on the the uh, corners and kind of like an oligopoly almost because there's three of them and so notice that they're all saying spare 43 cents spare 43 cents and they all fix their same price so uh, you know no one um, is getting the um, better end of the deal or worse end of the deal so price fixing oftentimes happens when there's very few sellers um, another thing that's illegal is uh, market allocation and market allocation was is where there's this um, Again, in it's usually in the case of like oligopolies where um, the uh, competitors will get together and they'll divide up the market among their producers. Uh, and so again, I keep going back to Pepsi and Coke, but it's a oligopoly that you're familiar with. So if Pepsi and Coke, for example, got together and they said, "Okay, you know, we're, we're going to divide this up between us, and we're going to say, okay, Pepsi gets you know the Northwest, and uh, Coke's going to get the." Um, uh, Southwest and we're gonna have uh, Coke get the Midwest and the Pepsi gets the Northeast and Coke gets the Southeast or whatever and so they divide it up um, quote-unquote equally among themselves so all they're doing is basically taking up um, this if we imagine the markets this pie um, and they would each take their own little piece of the pie now it's okay if consumers choose to do this but it's not okay if the producers decide to divide it up among themselves. So for example, um, when you're going on college visits, you may notice that um, some campuses are specifically Pepsi campuses and they only have Pepsi on campus, right? Or Coke campuses or whatever, okay? It's not as if Pepsi and Coke did that deliberately and they like divided up the, all the colleges in the United States among themselves. It's more of the uh, college itself was looking into, you know, what soft drinks they were gonna have offered for sale on their campus and they probably you know looked at both of them and both of them you know made their case and you know one or the other made them a better deal made them a better offer right and so that was totally up to the choice of the college okay and that's all right that's not market allocation. Market allocation is where the producers actually going to divide it up. They're going to be the ones that actually um, decide you know who gets what area of the market. Um, also illegal is what we call predatory pricing and this is going to be where you're setting your prices so low that you drive out competition um, and in the case of um, predatory pricing this is a case where you're going to have um, either a monopoly or oligopolies that um, they may have another company that tries to enter the market right and they will try and enter the market um, but the uh, the big guys, the big guns, the, the big producers will drive them out by dropping the price so low that nobody else can compete with it. Um, Microsoft was an example of this. We talked about Microsoft being brought up on charges um, by the Justice Department um, in the late 90s. This was a case of predatory pricing because they were giving away um, Internet Explorer um, for nothing, for free. 
right? And no other company could compete with that. That's what we call predatory pricing. Um, you know, they're driving out the competition just because they set it so low. Some people argue Walmart does this um, with little, um, tiny little towns. You know, they talk about um, when Walmart comes to a town, what happens is, is that they gobble up all the business from all the small um, real t retailers because nobody else can compete with that. They have their prices so low that local retailers, they're like, well, I can't set my price that low. Um, but Walmart can because they're so big. So price fixing and market allocation and predatory pricing all in there in the cases of like oligopolies. So predatory pricing is kind of the exact opposite of price fixing. Price fixing is you set it too high. Price fi predatory pricing, you set it too low. So um, a third thing that the government may do is, is that they will do things to ensure um, that they're protecting consumers, trying to protect the consumers that are out there. So one thing that they will do is they will offer what they will tell um, producers these cease and desist orders. And basically, um, it's kind of a slap on the wrist, basically, for producers. And um, it's basically where the company has um, been accused of, for example, predatory pricing or price fixing or market allocation, one of those three from the last slide and the government will come out and say okay stop that that's not nice stop it right now and it's like a warning right um, another thing they will do to protect consumers is they will have public disclosure laws and so this is when the business has to reveal public and for product information so they will reveal information about for example what the product is made from um, what's in it what's uh, where is it made those kinds of things. And that's helpful to ensure that the consumer has the most information, the most accurate information, so that they can make the best decision. So um, sign up being, you can sign up for recalls. Um, those are good public disclosure. Um, you know, the government will tell you if, for example, that something, a product has been recalled, um, or even nutrition labels on the back of, for example, a Gatorade bottle or any other food product. Those are all examples of protecting the consumer. All right, so, so far, those are all regulations. Um, they all kind of fall under regulation. So the um, antitrust laws, um, the ways that we ensure fair competition, as well as how we try and protect consumers. But the last way that the government gets involved is through what we call deregulation. And deregulation is this idea that we're gonna be removing government control. Um, so it's the exact opposite of regulation. Um, for a long time, the government felt the only way to help producers and consumers was just to pray, you know, have a lot of laws out there. Let's just have a lot of laws that, you know, says what can, um, producers can and cannot do. But deregulation is basically the opposite theory. Um, and deregulation is the idea of, well, maybe if we let up on some of this control, maybe they'll make more money and it'll encourage more businesses to get involved which is exactly what happened um, in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, basically, um, a lot of people argued that regulations were cutting into companies' profits. Um, they weren't making any money um, because they had to follow all these government rules, specifically um, the airline interest industry. This was huge in the airline industry in the 1970s and 80s, and they had all these um, um, all these rules and regulations, and so they started to get rid of some of them. Um, and some people thought it was going to be like this. This is uh, the cover of Time magazine um, from, uh, I think, 1979, 1980, something like that. It says, new era in the air, cheap fares, crowded flights. So they felt like it was going to be this pack sardine can on uh, airline companies. Uh, but it actually worked out and encouraged more businesses to get involved in the airline industry and it brought down prices because basically it was a right shift in supply. Um, more businesses were attracted to the area because they got more profits. Um, so as a whole, what I wanted to get you out of this video is, is that keep in mind that the government gets involved from the standpoint of trying to ensure within these market structures that we have fair competition, that we don't have trust, that we have fair competition, we have, um, we're protecting consumers, and that um, you know, we have the best way possible. All right, that's it for Chapter 7. Let me know if you have any questions.